Hello, this is Herman Osterwick and uh, welcome to the Hangout about Vendor Neutral Archiving. And we have a quite a distinguished panel today. We have Joe Marion, who is the uh, domain expert. I'm going to talk about the uh, Vendor Neutral Archiving. And we also have um, some people available to, uh, to deal with the question and answers, which is Mitchell Goldberg from Dell and uh, Shannon Werb from Acuo Technologies. So, um, yeah. Let's get started. Joe, um, I'm going to take off and, and, and uh, uh, show us what you have to present. And also, you might want to introduce yourself uh, as well a little bit. Go ahead. OK. Uh, my name is Joe Marion, and I'm principal of Healthcare Integration Strategies. I've been in healthcare for 36 years and have uh, been on the vendor side as well as a consultant for the last 20 years, uh, particularly in PACS. And uh, what I'd like to discuss today is uh, the vendor neutral archive. So I'm going to switch to the slides and we'll get started. Uh, understanding the vendor neutral archive. Uh, there are many different definitions and a lot of confusion with regard to uh, what the VNA terminology really stands for. And I think as you'll see as we go through this presentation that there are multiple definitions or multiple uh, terminologies uh, for the VNA that are important uh, to understand as you uh, plan some development. So let's begin by looking at some of the factors that affect the VNA. Uh, in particular, the picture archive and communication systems has sort of been the gold standard for image management and archival, uh, particularly for uh, future recall uh, and access to images. And it's relied on uh, both a short-term cache for immediate accessibility to the images, as well as a long-term archive employing uh, lower cost media since the media uh, in those days was so expensive. And in terms of uh, images, uh, the accessibility to those images was pretty much limited to accessing through the packs. Uh, so if the packs went down, there was no access to images. And in terms of uh, the images uh, themselves, they might be stored on the packs in a proprietary format. Uh, versus DICOM in some particular systems and again they wouldn't be accessible unless you went through the packs. Uh, in terms of uh, facilities uh, that may be looking for a lower cost solution and long-term uh, mitigation of data migration as part of a PACS update or replacement. So in the context of uh, say a PACS uh, update uh, the objective might be to provide uh, more storage capacity uh, but get away from the particular uh, vendor, PAX vendors um, uh, archive to do that. And in the case of a replacement system, uh, there may be an advantage to implementing uh, the uh, VNA initially so that there isn't any migration uh, necessary. Uh, from a departmental services perspective, uh, many departments realize that IT certainly is more uh, efficient in terms of managing uh, information system technology and they may be more effective in terms of uh, procuring uh, the infrastructure for a VNA uh, as well as um, uh, more cost effective in terms of uh, service maintenance contracts on the archive uh, equipment. Uh, because they can buy in bulk and uh, maybe negotiate a better price as opposed to most packs that may be negotiated separately uh, and are only for that infrastructure. So in those cases, the, um, there would be a advantage to uh, IT managing those uh, contracts. Uh, and another area that has not really been addressed by PACS is the question of disaster recovery and business continuity. Uh, so the, uh, there are newer, more cost-effective alternatives, uh, particularly in the case of uh, disaster recovery uh, in the context of remote or cloud-based services 
that may be more cost effective to use as a long-term archive as well as uh, provide disaster recovery for local storage. And in addition to that, uh, from a business continuity perspective, uh, if I could access those remote uh, images directly, then uh, in essence I wouldn't need the local packs to uh, be able to uh, still continue to view images. So even if the local packs is down from a business continuity perspective, I still have accessibility to my images. Some additional factors that may affect the VNA is uh, in the context of uh, multiple departmental packs uh, such as radiology and cardiology, uh, they may have their own archives and need to be accessed and managed separately. Uh, so certainly an advantage would, of a VNA might be to bring those uh, separate departmental solutions into a common environment. Uh, also the advent of healthcare reform initiatives such as the ARA Meaningful Use and the subsequent uh, emphasis on implementation of EMRs, electronic medical records, has meant that um, there's a need for more universal accessibility to the images. Uh, so if one has multiple packs, then uh, there is no singular point of access for uh, bringing those images into the EMR. In the case of a VNA, that would enable uh, the EMR to look to one location for retrieval of, of images and be much more efficient uh, in terms of providing overall quality of care. Uh, also from the enterprise requirements, um, it may encompass uh, handling more image formats than just DICOM. So if I'm only focused on radiology's needs or cardiology's needs, uh, probably DICOM is okay. But once I get beyond those two services, uh, there may be uh, the need for additional image formats. And in uh, many cases, if I'm going uh, beyond just the single uh, location in an enterprise environment, uh, it may make more sense to use the emerging uh, uh, IHE standard, uh, XDS or cross-document sharing standard uh, that encompasses images. <clears throat> so it's important to um, be able to handle more than just DICOM information. Uh, another factor is the proliferation of imaging data uh, that complicates the life cycle management aspect. So uh, many facilities have um, uh, certain regulations in the context maybe of retaining uh, image information for five years and then uh, have an opportunity to purge that information. So if I have to go to around to two or three or four different systems uh, to purge that information, it can become a timely process. Uh, so again, if I have a single rule set, uh, it would make it much more efficient in terms of purging that information. Also, there's growing interest in regional health image management uh, repositories uh, so that a single healthcare facility uh, may be looking to consolidate or collaborate across multiple entities and these regional uh, devices uh, may eventually extend into imaging and having a VNA in place may uh, uh, accelerate the ability to encompass imaging in those systems. Okay, in terms of VNA strategies, uh, let's look at uh, several levels of implementations uh, that may be applicable to uh, different people's needs. So from a level one perspective, uh, the PACS replacement archive, uh, in many instances, uh, it's a departmental focus. It will is focused on augmenting or replacing uh, a PACS vendor's archive infrastructure and it most likely is going to be DICOM based uh, primarily because uh, it's replacing uh, an existing DICOM or potentially a proprietary format uh, and, it, and the impetus to do that may be to get information into a DICOM format uh, because the PACS itself is proprietary. Uh, also um, it can help minimize uh, the migration because if I can get the information into a VNA, then certainly I don't have to um, migrate that data at a later time. Um, also, it can enable third-party device uh, access, so uh, advanced visualization systems uh, perhaps as an expansion of a, an existing PACS without having to uh, 
uh, throw away the existing packs means that I could add uh, those types of capabilities that could draw directly from the VNA as opposed to again having to go through the packs. And similarly, uh, there are alternative workflow uh, applications that are emerging in the marketplace, such as uh, Metacalis, and uh, being able to take advantage of some of those capabilities, again, may be enhanced if they can draw information directly from the VNA. Uh, and as uh, we previously mentioned, in terms of disaster recovery, business continuity aspects, uh, the uh, archive uh, could encompass uh, either off-site or cloud-based applications for remote storage of information uh, that may be more cost-effective. From a level two perspective, uh, very similar to level one, but in this instance it may be uh, the objective of sharing the archive across multiple resources. So if you have multiple packs in say radiology and cardiology and gastroenterology or other areas, uh, they may want to share a common archive resource and in that case uh, replacing the individual archives with a common infrastructure uh, with shared management rules uh, will provide uh, more uh, cost-effective and um, uh, management uh, effective um, handling of that image content. Uh, most likely because many of those services are DICOM based that device could be DICOM uh, compliant. Uh, in some instances, it may need to accommodate non-DICOM data as well uh, if that information is generated. Uh, it can avoid the migration costs. So uh, as an example, in one facility that I worked with in uh, upstate New York, uh, there was uh, a need to replace both radiology and cardiology packs. And the objective was uh, perhaps to consider a vendor neutral archive as a first step because then the data could be migrated off of both of those existing packs uh, before they were replaced and in that instance then there wouldn't be any additional migration cost. So it can be a very effective tool in terms of consolidating and avoiding uh, future uh, migration. Um, also it's an opportunity to consolidate equipment procurement and maintenance contracts as we've previously discussed uh, and it may again encompass uh, some element of off-site or cloud-based applications. From a level three perspective uh, the enterprise image management uh, approach uh, may be driven more by um, enterprise initiatives such as the implementation of an EMR. So in that instance, uh, if I'm putting in an EMR and I want image accessibility to the EMR, it may be easier to do that to draw from one image source than uh, to have to interface to multiple packs. Uh, it could certainly be DICOM, but uh, in the context of enterprise, if you're going to go to that level of implementation, there most likely will be some other image formats uh, involved as well. And then uh, it would create the central image repository, if you will, for all of the ologies. And most likely that would be the impetus to also implement a universal image viewer for non-diagnostic display purposes. So if the EMR needs access to images, it may launch this uh, image viewer uh, as a zero footprint viewer uh, to display images from all of the ologies uh, as opposed to uh, separate viewers for each area. Uh, and then it would also encompass a common uh, set of lifecycle management rules uh, so that again, I don't have to purge individual systems. They could be purged in uh, one central location. And similarly, it can have a element of offsite or cloud-based uh, storage as well. Uh, level four is the regional repository uh, participation. And in that instance, it may be driven by the need for a common repository across multiple facilities, uh, either as part of an enterprise or part of a larger uh, state or local um, health information exchange. Uh, and it probably will, at that point, uh, be uh, valuable to look at the XDSI compliant uh, format such that uh, with a registry, I can have a common um, registry of information uh, as opposed to having individual archives at each location. Uh, and that can encompass either a centralized or federated architecture. So if each facility has its own VNA, 
Uh, certainly then those can be uh, brought together under XDS with a common registry or uh, alternatively in the case of a centralized facility uh, those may be either a joint or third party management uh, aspect and uh, centrally located and again they may uh, in the context of centrally located be an off-site facility uh, from several of the enter uh, enterprises uh, or it could be a cloud-based uh, component as well uh, and one aspect of uh, cloud-based that we haven't discussed is the aspect that if um, uh, I have many um, outreach applications and I want some capability of segregating that data from an individual site's data, uh, the cloud may be a useful uh, factor for accomplishing that. Okay, if we look at the architecture of a, uh, a VNA, you'll note that there are various imaging devices that uh, are involved, uh, either the modalities themselves or PAC systems that are going to generate information and they need an archival infrastructure to store them and it's the uh, middle services if you will that constitute most uh, VNA uh, applications so you can consider them primarily to be middleware uh, and they would consist of some form of services uh, that uh, communicate with the imaging devices and packs uh, either as DICOM or HL7 or Mint or XDSI or other formats of information and these are the management services to figure out how to correctly connect to the various imaging devices. The image management and workflow services are going to be how the system itself handles the data and the workflow processes. So the lifecycle management, replicating the data from one media to another, uh, di DICOM tag morphing and other types of uh, data modifications if you will uh, to make the data accessible across the enterprise and then certainly the infrastructure interfaces uh, that would adapt to both spinning media and other uh, uh, more permanent medias as well as morphing of data or data protection uh, protocols uh, that are the interface in essence with the actual archive infrastructure uh, so let's consider some of the aspects uh, as you consider where do I land or how do I look at uh, considering a VNA. Uh, certainly uh, from a visionary point of view, you have to start by securing a common understanding of a VNA objective. So if you sat uh, several services and IT down in a room and asked them the question of what's the objective of a VNA, my guess is you would probably have three or four different uh, objectives or different answers and the, uh, the need is to get to a common scope and assure that all of the services are represented. So uh, that may be uh, somewhat of a roadmap or a timeline, uh, but the key here is to get to a common understanding and scope that addresses everyone's uh, requirements or has the ability to address everyone's requirements over time. And then certainly that's going to need uh, to be both a departmental and an IT buy-in for that so trying to do something independent of IT uh, may work in the short term but again in an ARA meaningful use environment it's going to uh, be beneficial to have IT as a focal point of this activity and as I've said uh, planning today is important if you want to achieve the future so even though you may not implement the full say level 4 uh, scale of a solution today uh, it ought to be done in against a common strategy so that you have the ability to achieve that uh, level four capability eventually. Uh, what are the benefits of uh, accomplishing this? Certainly uh, key benefits are going to be lower operational and maintenance costs because again if I can uh, share that uh, enterprise IT infrastructure uh, it gives me leverage uh, on the maintenance aspects as well as uh, potentially uh, procurement of the equipment and it also uh, may be an opportunity to option or uh, optimize uh, the equipment purchases so that uh, I can meet everyone's requirements. Uh, it also will minimize uh, the uh, migration process in the context that uh, again it avoids any proprietary data storage and means that I can easily move information from one uh, 
system to another and minimize the need to do any migrations. Uh, certainly another aspect is improving the clinical accessibility as part of ARA meaningful use. So uh, many of these uh, zero footprint technologies that are emerging today are linked to this such that uh, I can have one viewer and access all of the image content associated with that particular patient. And again, expanding the capabilities without uh, necessarily replacing the legacy packs is an additional benefit. So many facilities uh, may want to add uh, more robust uh, advanced visualization capabilities or other workflow aspects, uh, but they're not ready or don't feel a necessity to replace the complete packs, uh, this would give them an opportunity to uh, expand those capabilities without uh, affecting the legacy packs. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to uh, Herman for uh, any discussion. Okay, thank you very much. And I have a question, uh, Joe. I, I talked to an institution and they said, well, they have videos all over the hospital. They have departments that make videos from people with a certain walking uh, disabilities uh, to make videos from the gate and if people are speech pathology and so all this video and they said, well, how do, well, how do I handle all these MPEG files? How do you see that being handled in, in the in the context of a VNA? How do we get all these videotapes and all that stuff integrated? Go ahead. Well, again, I think that's part of the rationale and reason for suggesting uh, that a enterprise scale solution uh, not only handle uh, the DICOM data, but handle other information as well and you know, potentially in native format. So if uh, clearly uh, a lot of the facilities that I've dealt with, that is a major issue in the context of Sleep Lab and other applications where they want to be able to store that information. So being able to handle that information in native format, I think, is going to be very important to a VNA uh, from an enterprise perspective. Okay. Um, another question for Mitchell, just appropriately a commute in, 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 in the picture. Mitchell, um, because you were involved with Dell as a, the infrastructure people for the VNA, so to speak. And um, one of the things that uh, uh, that I, uh, when I talk with hospitals, they, they seem to uh, to fear coming up is the pathology. Uh, pathology department uh, is going to be a huge impact on DNA. And so, and if I asked them, well, how do you think you're going to handle that? They said, well, we really don't know. Uh, can you give any uh, your perspective? How you do you have any experience with that, or what do you, would you suggest? Well, it's certainly a challenge. Um, as probably the nearest term largest data set problem, meaning that, um, as you said, the, a radiology study may be 50 megabytes, but a pathology could be two and a half gigabytes. So for, I think what we're, one of the definition problems, and Joe, um, I'm looking to your facial reaction on this, is understanding VNA, whether it includes the storage or whether it is just the software layer right, it is one of the differentiations here. So if you catalog the pathology data, I think there are a couple ways to do that. Today, uh, people are cataloging key images, right? They're using secondary capture, cataloging pathology images, but not the entire case. Um, we're working with a company now and that has a um, standards-based interface and is storing the two and a half gigabyte studies, you know, from automated slide, um, scanners. So the challenge becomes how do you deal with these large images? You, it's not a VNA problem as much as it is a what do you do with the data once you have it, right? So there's two issues. One is storage and then one is how do you, what bandwidth can you possibly expect to have to share a two and a half gigabyte um, study over the internet? So the short answer is I think it has a limited effect on the VNA software that catalogs and indexes information. Um, I'm sure Shannon um, has some experience with non-DICOM things like that. It has much more impact on how do you store it long term and then how do you share the information. Yeah, Mitch, if that's all right, um, maybe I can just add a little perspective to that as well. Um, I, I had an opportunity to sit in on a presentation with uh, Paul Chang. Many of you may know came out of uh, UPMC largely considered the sort of founder of Stentor, which became Phillips Pax. He's now um, he's now at uh, University of Chicago Medical Center, 
as a radiologist, he was actually uh, requested and did the keynote at the uh, American College of Pathology, I think is what it's referred to as. Yep. And he, he essentially was asked to take a look at how does or how would he propose from an informatics perspective to solve the pathology problem. And his perspective is that pathology workflow and radiology workflow is entirely different and we got to stop trying to put these things together. Um, uh, his argument is that if you take a look at a normal um, uh, workload of, from a pathologist, they very, very rarely um, look at the historical slides. And so this whole slide imaging perspective that many companies are pursuing right now, his argument is, why are we worried about whole slide imaging in the archival uh, attribute or the archival problem? What we should really be thinking about is more of the telepathology approach or the workflow associated with the distribution of the content so it can be reviewed. Um, the, the interesting areas of the, uh, of the lesion, so to speak, and not worrying about archiving it digitally. So you can find all this information online. It's very interesting sort of work associated with how a radiologist says, don't bring radiology workflow to pathology and start thinking about it a little differently. Uh, that said, I do agree if you do store it, largely it doesn't impact the VNA from an indexing perspective software wise it's much more of a storage issue from a storage perspective right and and, and our experience one other comment and I, I support everything you've said our experience in working with the Perio um, is exactly around teleconsulting and that again I think you Joe pointed out in his presentation it's very important not only to think about a VNA but think about how the data will be shared and it's not about workflow as much as it is um, what do you do with these two and a half gigabyte studies for teleconsultation it's just impractical unless you have a hosted application that renders it like many of the other universal viewers that are out there Great. So I have another question um, by the way first of all I like to say that there's an excellent uh, 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 description of VNA on uh, Wikipedia, and I think David Clooney had something to do with that. But uh, one of the things that he uh, uh, that on Wikipedia when they talk about tech morphing is that uh, you know a tech morphing engine is really nothing else than an interface engine. So my question more to uh, maybe Shannon, uh, tech morphing. You know, we talk about vendor neutral archiving, and we still find out we still need to fix a lot of un-neutral things and vendor specific things, do you see that increasing, decreasing, well, how does tech morphing, or do you see that happening, evolving in the future? Go ahead, uh, Shannon. Uh, th thanks, Herbert. It's, it's a good question. and I, I would be interested to have a debate with David about this. Uh, him and I <laughs> seem to, we seem to bump into each other on webinars and at places like SIM and public forums to have a debate, but uh, he's often looked at tag morphing as a uh, uh, sorry, a necessary evil. Uh, right. it, it would and it should go away uh, as well. And, 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 I, and I'm not sure I totally agree with that perspective, but I, I do agree that tag morphing isn't sort of the end all be all definition of what makes up a VNA. It's, it is an important attribute. Um, I don't think it will go away. Uh, I have a hard time estimating if it's going to go down or up the need, but I just, I just want to give a couple of examples of why uh, tag morphing is necessary from a more clinical perspective and may not, maybe more than um, uh, uh, interface engine problem. As an example, and maybe you could argue uh, the need to drive an EMPI integration being something around an interface engine, but clinically if a clinician is actually consuming data from a VNA that came from different departments or different facilities or even across an HIE, you may be dealing with patient ID problems. And if they're consuming that data outside of a modern viewing technology and in a more traditional fax, the need to have that patient ID morphed, so to speak, into the local domain will always be necessary. Granted, I think, and David may make the argument, granted, I think the PAX vendor should be more flexible. But until that occurs, you're going to need things like tag morphing. Another classic example we see all the time, our customers and our partners configure our solution. We do it ourselves when we're a VNA and even when we're doing data migration is hanging protocols. Yeah. You take yeah. a look at the way hanging protocols in a Philips PAC system works and hanging protocols within a McKesson PAC system or possibly cardiology data that's going to be hung within a uh, 
uh, radiology PAC system, we're often morphing procedure and series descriptions in order to drive better clinical hanging protocols for the consuming physician. So again, this is getting into cross-system review of data. Within the same system, not a problem. But when you go cross-system, that's a problem. And finally, finally and this is the, one of the most interesting applications I've seen, we call it series consolidation. We've now seen it occur across multiple vendors. Our first exposure was when Siemens came to us and said, look, we manufacture a very common fluoroscopy unit. And that fluoroscopy unit produces a single image for every series instance UID within a study. And many PAC systems have the ability to be smart and say, oh, that's fluoroscopy. I'm going to hang that in a single stack along the monitor so I can pan through it as a clinician. Well, if you consume it within a Philips PAX, um, the Philips PAX system isn't smart enough, and it hangs it as a bunch of different series, which the doctor has to hang in different viewports. So clinically, it makes absolutely no sense. So we configure, again, it's not you know software engineering. We configure tag morphing to be smart enough to say, if it's fluoroscopy, it's from a semen scanner, um, and I see uh, a different series instance UID show up for image number one and image number two never appears. We then start incrementing the image count and putting it in the same series. So very interesting sort of clinical needs for tag morphing that we see show up in our customer base. So I, I don't think it'll ever go away. Oh, yeah. um, I'm not sure it's going to increase, but I don't think it will reduce because we seem to bump into these things every week, something new that a customer wants to use. And, and, and just, to, just to amplify that, we see, you know, having stored studies now for 12 years, we have systems that uh, sent to an archive exams and their user interfaces were underpopulated. So for your specific example, um, Shannon, we've, we've had to populate things based on um, the new PAC systems and the new protocols. So it, um, it deals with old data, making it current to be compliant with the new systems. Absolutely correct, Mitch. We, we, we see that all the time as well. When a customer goes through a PAX replacement, even with the VNA, morphing needs to apply. Okay. Yep. So interesting. The, 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 the necessary evil, but you think it's going to be more like an interface engine solution, which is basically a given in HL7 world. People know about it. People use it. Uh, and they know that there are so many variations of HL7, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Maybe we will evolve the tech morphing to a DICOM interface engine. Who knows? Uh, Mitchell, um, some people uh, that I speak with, they're a little bit confused about cloud versus VNA. Is it the same? Is it different? Or is it totally, completely different? What is your explanation of cloud and VNA? What do you, what do you think? So um, it's a little bit of apples and oranges. Um, okay. VNA, as we as we heard from Joe, is a uh, a feature set um, that creates the ability for sharing of information. Um, that has an archive layer, which is the media based element. Cloud is is a delivery mechanism, right? It's not. Um, it's not. Um, it can be storage, it can be a hosted solution. So if you look at the alternatives that the, for the four scenarios that Joe pointed out there, there are, um, there are performance reasons and there are um, prime examples of infrastructure simplification that people come to the cloud for. And in that context, for especially medical imaging, which is occupying so much storage in hospitals, putting the VNA in the cloud serves two purposes. One, it catalogs the information in a vendor neutral way so you have business continuance and disaster recovery, um, but it also provides a cost benefit through infrastructure simplification that you may not get if you're putting the storage on site. So they're not the same. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, um, Shannon. Um, about a year ago, not maybe not as popular anymore, but about a year ago, there certainly the new protocol came up, Mint, M-A-N-T, and and uh, so some some people see VNA as a DICOM archive, what I call it. You know, DICOM is the only thing that's ever going to be supported. I think, and I was going to look for your reaction and your view of it. I think that there will be other protocols. There's XDSI, there will be Wadu. Mint and who knows what is the impact on the VA? What, what, uh, Shannon, can you give that your perspective? So I need to worry. Is it going to be obsolete or? Go ahead. 
I'm starting to think you're starting to pick on me now, Herman. That's yeah, another, that's okay. That's another, that's another David Clooney debate that I had last <laughs> week. Uh, so, so my perspective is similar to yours, actually, and that is that the VNA serves as a, a data ownership uh, tool or solution, let's call it, for a customer. And one of the areas that customers are trying to uh, uh, provide or create um, uh, is really access to their data. And so Mint, and, and I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Mint, stands for Medical Image Network Transport. Mm -hmm. It came out of Johns Hopkins, and it sort of had three, let's call it three tracks. Um, primarily the area that we've been focused is access of data that's at rest. Um, there's also an attribute of Mint that talks about how data gets stored within a repository, which had some pretty compelling um, value propositions around being able to swap out the VNA software layer and still address the data in storage. And the third was, uh, as, a, as, a, as an acquisition protocol, i.e. replace DICOM in the modality, my personal opinion is I think the guys pushing Mint got too caught up in the modality side of the business because it's such an established market that it created a lot of challenges for people to get behind it. But let's put that aside for a second. I think the data access mechanism is extremely important. Okay. So we invested in Mint early on. Uh, we built, built out uh, uh, Mint access on DICOM stored content. Um, we've expanded Mint-like, if you want to call it. Uh, our CTO will say Minty. Minty access to data within our system, even non-DICOM. Uh, and we actually have live customer sites with Vital Images using Mint as the protocol for transport for access to data within storage. The interesting thing about that is that put us in an extremely positive position related to DICOM Working Group 27, I think it's 27, 26 or 27, which is really yeah. um, uh, uh, DICOM-based uh, web services. And so DICOM-based web services is taking a look at WADO RS, or WADO version 2, if you want to call it, which is very Mint-like. Um, it, uh, it, it, it also complies well with some things around what we're doing within the XDS space. We are a big believer in data access. So store the data via DICOM, via web services, via XDS, via some sort of integration engine, and then access the data via DICOM, via Mint, via WADO, or via some sort, of, some sort of web service to get the data out directly into the application that you need. We call it service orchestration, and it lives on the data that aren't just one protocol versus another. So Mint aside, we think different protocols to access data are very important. OK. okay. Uh, Joe, I haven't picked on you for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> let me I'm ask you a question. Um, you know, if I would be in a, in a, in a user perspective, I, I would uh, look at a VNA and actually uh, some of the um, uh, surveys that we did uh, they indicate that at least 40 to 50 percent of all the users out there that currently have a PAX are looking for VNA. So uh, there's a lot of um, interest, uh, but also what I hear from the users that they're still confused. So I think one of the things you did uh, very well is try to differentiate different levels, uh, level one, two, three, and four. But again, every vendor says we have a VNA, we have a VNA, we have a VNA. But how can a user? Can you give some tools or some aids? For a user to figure out who, what is the real VNA or what level of VNA, or how can I uh, f find out what are the specifications? Um, because I know you help quite a few uh, users uh, figuring out uh, what architecture to pick. Go ahead. Sure. I think aside from the politics within any individual organization, uh, part of the issue is that. Uh, you have to make sure that maybe there's a central or focal point and the the most likely candidate for that is the IT organization. Okay. So if one uh, engages IT to say I have these set of requirements, how does that fit into the big picture? Then uh, I think it's uh, beholden on IT uh, to say okay how does that fit uh, relative to maybe what I've heard in other areas. So certainly in the context of uh, uh, making sure that cardiology and maybe other imaging areas are reflected in that discussion so that one can say, well, here are a set of requirements. And it may turn out that uh, I think it comes down to priorities and budgets uh, so that if there's an immediate need in radiology, but cardiology and uh, maybe some other services aren't uh, there yet, but they will be maybe through, uh, I worked with one facility in the uh, Illinois area, 
uh, that was uh, doing an ambulatory care center and they wanted it to be paperless and filmless. So therein uh, was a uh, an aspect that some of the departmentals maybe weren't sensitized to, but certainly it meant that they needed uh, some form of VNA and accessibility independent of a, maybe some of the PAC systems uh, so that they could bring that up uh, in a, a paperless and filmless environment. So I think if one goes through all of those requirements and understands them, uh, then one can put the priorities properly to it to build sort of a what I would refer to as a roadmap as to how do you get from here to the future. And so you don't necessarily need to go f uh, right to level four, but you need to have a roadmap how to go from level one, two, three, and four, and you use IT as kind of the focal point to put this roadmap together. That's correct? Exactly. And again, it's uh, the, the major objective there is to avoid the redundancy of uh, system structure so that you're not uh, adding cost to the healthcare process. And then, um, so let's say you have a reduction in a row from a user perspective, then how to find out whether a vendor meets the requirements? What is the process that you would suggest for that? Well, again, I think that's also going to be a function of uh, the planning process. So uh, to Mitch's point earlier, uh, it's more than just, uh, our VNA can be more than just the middleware application. One also has to look at the infrastructure it's going to sit on. And uh, in that instance, if the facility's infrastructure is not adequate for today or the future, uh, then it may need to be that uh, in terms of that acquisition, you consider both the middleware and the infrastructure at the same time. Uh, and that builds you the capability to uh, develop an environment that is compatible with what your, your needs are. And what I actually was kind of alerting to is that I would think that you would really want to use a formal RFP process to find out what requirements are so that the vendor knows what you're looking for and then then you can meet you know, can see whether that those characteristics meet your requirements correct most definitely yeah and that's that's uh, sometimes a differentiator in vendors in that some vendors say they are software only so if your requirement is for both hardware and software uh, it may behoove you to look at uh, other particular suppliers or vendors that can maybe provide an integrated solution. You yeah. know, Herman, Herman, I would just I would just want, want to make one quick comment. You know, from an RFP perspective, having responded like Shannon to countless um, RFPs, you know, you know, when they ask the some of the templates that are out there ask for you know DICOM conformance statements. Uh, HL7 conformance statements, XDS um, documentation or IHG documentation, and it's it is a um, I think much more important for as a contribution to the industry for people like yourself and Joe to clearly articulate to the vendors what is the roadmap, right? What is the cost objective in the RFP? It's not it, you know whether it's one DICOM library, another DICOM library. Um, whether you everyone has Mint or everyone has Wado, it, those are um, really fine points. Um, but what we need in order to respond collectively to the customer is we need to understand their roadmap as Joe laid out. Are they integrating Sleep Lab, ophthalmology, oncology, um, and move away and really educate the market that they need to move away from radiology and cardiology. They need to look at scan documents in the greater and the RFP should communicate that to the market um, in the solicitation what that roadmap is. Yeah, that's a great point and, and I think <clears throat> the uh, in, in general if you look at PACs, I wouldn't say that PACs have been commoditized but there are not a lot of RFPs anyway, out there in, in the PACs area but for the VNA, I mean it's it's crucial. It's crucial because there are so many VNAs out there, so much confusion about different terms, different capabilities. And so it's really crucial because a VNA, think about the whole enterprise and like you said, all the different departments, uh, uh, the different levels and the, 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 the roadmap. So yeah, another point to, uh, to really, uh, you know, make sure that you do your homework. Right. Okay. I, I think I'm kind of on the end of, of my question. Is there any other uh, questions from the audience? Go ahead. Let me open it up one more time. So um, 
I'd be interested, this is Shannon uh, Herman, I'd be interested in expanding upon that cloud question to Mitch. Um, I, I read a report, you probably read it as well, and I just am interested in your perspective. I agree with you, by the way, 100% that VNA and cloud are sort of apples and oranges, and putting VNA in the cloud is very confusing, and I think there's a lot of interpretation right now. Mike Dolan, our head of sales, calls it very foggy, and the fog will lift someday, and we call that the cloud. But uh, what, what this report that came out from Inmedica in June talked about and predicted that pure cloud delivery of VNA um, was going to grow over the next five years less than 10%. It was like 2 or 3% per year. Whereas hybrid, and they define hybrid as having at least a copy for three to five years on site in a VNA installed on site with a second copy in the cloud was predicted to be about 40% of the market of VNA uh, over the next five years. Um, so the reasoning behind that in the report was that customers' perception of putting data in the cloud is that they lose control. What do you feel about that? What do you think about that? Do you think hybrid is going to be the way, way that we get cloud into medical imaging and VNA? Do you think customers will start putting more primary copy in the cloud? I'm just interested in your perspective. You asking me? You asking me? Or Mitch. Mitch would be great, and you as well. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, read the report, talked with Theo at length about it. Um, it, um, you know, it's a global perspective, and I think if you look at the um, global experience with cloud, um, some people treated the cloud purely as a storage layer, like the London trusts that you and I have been visiting, and uh, greetings from London. Um, the um, their experience here was they absolutely lost control of the data because the files in the cloud were defined in a file structure by the packs that put them there. So it was not a VNA in the cloud, and there it was a. There's been a lot of um, discontent in the ability to provide the lack of ability to provide business continuance and rapid disaster recovery um, in the states where uh, or in other countries where. Um, Dell is present where we have a, in, a VNA in the cloud, so to speak, which is mostly in a hybrid mode um, just because of the transmission speeds in some foreign countries. Um, to give performance to the applications, um, we agree with Theo that hybrid is, is the way to go. Um, in the context, as Joe always says, in the context that the, to eliminate the, the choke point of the bandwidth, um, you put the the uh, a buffer of uh, 18 months, three years, depending on the size of the primary fax cache, on site, and then when the doctor wants to hit it, or hits the archive for a comparative study, um, or in an EMR collaboration mode, all of that data is being served locally.